Ah, here we go. Hello, hello, hello. Hope everyone's having a good day. Give me one moment while we just finalize our bits and bobs. That anymore? Can close that off. All right. Hey there, cat. Uh, yeah. So just let me know if music is uh too loud or too quiet. Hopefully you can see everything all right. Okay. Right. Well, we'll start this off. Ah, good. We'll start this off to explain what we're doing here. So, uh, some of you may or may not know Call of Cthulhu 7 Edition. Uh, it's an RPG, tabletop RPG. They have these solo adventures. They're essentially like choose your own adventures. However, I'll be running through it, letting Jack choose uh, what to do and what not. And it should be a good introduction to the system for people who aren't sure about it. If there's an interest in this sort of thing, I might do some more of the other uh, solo adventures or even maybe some of the other more open uh, modules. Have to work out how to do those ones with Twitch, but we'll find out. Alright, well, don't think there's much else to say, but. Uh, Okay, well, let's begin. The sun is high in the sky, a merciless ball of heat. You feel scorched by the time you reach the bus halt in front of Osborne's drugstore. It's a relief to put down your heavy cases and take off your hat for a moment. You fan your face, it's been a long summer here in your hometown, and yet a curiously empty one. You look across the street at the grubby butcher shop, the grocer's with its faded ore and, and the shabby tobacco cyst. Mistrustful faces glare at you as they pass, eyeing your clothes and luggage. It was your parents' choice to live here, not yours. You were happy down south as a child, among Providence white-walled houses and leafy churchyards. Perhaps this new job in Arkham will cha uh, supply the change you need. Yet everybody you know in the world lives here. You know nobody in Arkham, not one soul. You ask yourself one last time if you're doing the right thing. The answer is here. None of your supposed friends have come to see you off. You are alone. Whatever challenges lie in Arkham, it will be a new life and a brave one. A small grey motor coach approaches and rattles to a stop. You put your hat back on and pick up your cases. Two young men with sullen expressions alight from the coach. One looks you up and down before heading away. The driver also steps down, glancing at you before crossing the road to visit the tapakist. When he returns, he is rolling a cigarette between his yellowed fingers. He gives it a final twist and examines you as he reaches for his matchbox. He is a thin man in his fifties, dressed in a stained shirt with the bus company emblem, yet his eyes are sharp in their dark sockets. Where to? You show him your ticket for OCP. From there, you will connect to Rochester and Portsmouth, before the coastal line to Newburyport and finally Arkham. You should be able to afford a rail ticket for at least some of the way, otherwise, this will be the first of many long bus trips. Mm hmm. The, bu uh, the driver scratches the match and lights his cigarette. The end flares as he takes a draw. Then he exhales and gestures to the back of the coach. Luggage, luggage racks up there. Right, now we start with a bit of character creation. So, we have strength, constitution, power, dexterity, appearance, size, and intelligence and education. We need to allocate some values to them. So I will just, 
I'll put them in chat. We have 40, 50, 50, 50, 60, 60, 70, and 80. So, we're using the quick fire method for, or at least a quick, really quick quick fire method for creating this character. What we'll do is we'll go through it, but I'll just give a quick breakdown of the stats. Let's see here. So, strength is uh, the higher it is, the more your investigator can lift or tightly cling to something. And it also inflicts like sort of damage in hand to hand. Constitution is your health and vigor, vitality. Size is like a combination of your height and weight. The higher the number, the more that is in total. Dexterity is for being quicker and num nimbler. Um, appearance it measures both a physical and uh, a physical attractiveness and personality. A higher uh, appearance is more charming and more unlikable. Intelligence represents how well you learn and remember and analyze information. Power indicates your force of will, like a willpower and a resistance against anything maybe magical. Education is a measure of former and factual knowledge, such as like school, college and whatnot. For most of these stats, 50 is considered human average apart from size in the indication where 60 is the average. So we'll start it off by saying the 40 um, stat. Where would you like it? Just give me one of the eight. Strength, constitution, size, dexterity, appearance, intelligence, power, or education. Right. 40 in appearance. Okay, we'll go with the 350. So one at a time. Education. And the next one. Size. And the next one. Oh, strength, not size? Yeah, okay. Oh, as in I put it... Oh, you are absolutely right. <laughs> My bad. Right, anyway, the last 50. Power is sense of willpower. It also affects your starting sanity. It's intelligence. All right. Okay. Now we have two sixties. Excellent. And the other one. Strength. Now we have 70, and whichever one uh, the other one will take an 80. So which one will be the 70? Power. Okay. 80 in on. Okay. So a lot of this has been automatically calculated on our sheet. 
some things to note is next to the numbers, let's say strength, for example, um, you have two numbers, a half value and a divided by five value. So half value of 60 is 30 divided by five, we get 12. So these are to do with um, results um, when rolling for tests. Um, if you need a regular success, you just need to get your value or lower out of a D100. Uh, for a hard success, you need to get half of your value or lower. And for an extreme success, you need to get um, under or equal to or under five divided by your stat. Hopefully that makes sense. But so some various things uh, affect your uh, movement. I believe that's if I remember, it's a combination of the strength index being higher than your size. Uh, your build is affected by your size and strength, or is it I'm pretty one of those, which can affect things like extra damage or things like that, and of course hit points. So we'll just put in these stats now. Very sane. Okay. The driver smokes and watches as you drag your cases to the back of the motor coach. The wreck is sent inconveniently high on the vehicle. You get a grip on the heavier case. So, just as an example, as about what some of this might involve, some of this will ask for checks, some of this will straight up note about certain values. For example, this is if your size is 40, you have to go to a Pacific, a certain something happens, if it's higher, you go somewhere else. Your size is higher than 40, so... The driver continues to enjoy his cigarette, watching with keen interest as you struggle with the cases. You grip your teeth and heave the second one into place. Perhaps the residents of Arkham will have better manners. The driver flicks his cigarette into the gutter and steps or into the motor coach. The Ips engine coughs into life. You board, grateful that you will be the only passenger for the initial part of your trip at least. With mixed emotions, you watch from the window as the tired avenues of your old home slip behind you receding into the distance. For a few minutes, you can still see the church spire over the bow of a low hill. Then the road dips and it too is gone. Arkham is your new home. You will travel there and make a new start. There's also something else I didn't put in the magic points that's also to do with power, but we will unlikely use magic in this if I recall correctly. Magic is more of a, an advanced aspect for... <laughs> New home, here we come. Absolutely right, Cat. Right, anyway. The coach putters through the countryside. At first, the interior is stifling and your stomach lurches with every bend in the road. However, the driver opens his window and by switching seats you find a spot where the breeze hits your face. You soon relax into the journey, observing the quaint little hamlets that the coach serves. A heavy set woman boards at one settlement and gives you a polite nod. She gets off at the next one. The road rises a little, passing cornfields and orchards. The leaves are turning and the trees are alive with glorious reds and golds. You have just begun to doze when the driver takes a tight bend at speed. Right, okay, just a second, we have... Okay, so... Uh, right, now we're going to roll for luck. Um, so... Since in this we're not worrying too much about, uh, it's a quick fire, very simple, so we're just going to roll once for luck and that's that, but in an actual, uh, like a module game, what you might do is, uh, depending on your age, you might get multiple rolls of luck or not. Luck is another stat that might come into play, it can come into case of maybe who is the unlucky one of a grunt, 
bunch of people that gets targeted, or it may be you're lucky in finding something. Maybe, for example, you want to try and find a knife. Um, the keeper who runs the game will uh, maybe ask you to make a luck roll. If you succeed, you find something, or what you were looking for. Such like that, as an example. There's not necessarily the only applications for it. But we will be rolling 3d6. And we will multiply that by 5. So we will be starting with 50 luck points. So yes, luck is 3d6 multiplied by 5. Okay. We now, given the, uh, the speed that's going around the bend, we need to make a dex check. Simple as, we will select dex from the character sheet. And we just need a regular success. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's one way to start it off. So, uh, to know, uh, depending on how high your skill is, uh, yeah, boom, you're absolutely right, Cat. 95 to 100 is like a fumble. Um, if you're very experienced in the task, then I believe only like a, a 100 or is it 99? Or 100 fa uh, fail fumbles. However, one on the opposite end is, as uh, you may be able to see here, um, a massive success. Like, wow. Did a backflip in the bus. <laughs> so we've used up all our luck, I think, so. Okay, so we passed the dex roll. <laughs> Worth it. A desperate yell awakens you. You feel yourself slide from the seat as the driver spins the wheel and the motor coach plunges off the road. You grab hold of the seat in front, just in time to prevent a painful fall. The coach stops with a thump. You now see what has happened. A Fordson tractor has stopped in the road and your driver has had to swerve to avoid the steel obstacle. He leaps from his seat into the road, unleashing a string of curses at the farmer. You take a moment to catch your breath. Perhaps you should offer assistance, but the driver has already returned. He backs the coach up, coach up a little and treads it around the tractor, glaring at the farmer. You resume your journey. The driver takes the curse with more caution than before. He glances over his shoulder at you a couple of times. Uh, sorry about before. That fellow was dumber than a hog. I'm Silas. What's your name? The accent was at least as much Silas's fault as the farmer's, but it doesn't seem sure to antagonize the man while he's driving you through the middle of nowhere. So, uh, we have the chance to make up a name if you want to change what we have on there. The boat we just got that labeled as Twitch. Gary? <laughs> sure. Gary. Okay. We can also add an age. The adventure recommends that you should probably be around 23 to 36 for this one, but we're not going to really worry about any statistics to do with age. So. Uh, we'll just do 23, shall we? Uh, sex, many. Okay! The coach turns onto a narrow road which weaves uphill through woodland. Silas becomes chatty. Going to Arkham, eh? I'll say I've ever heard of the place. Went to Boston once, didn't like it. Too much hustle and bustle. You got family there? A special someone waiting? The afternoon is wearing on. You see no harm in confiding to us about your new life. A job, eh? What's your line? Alright. 
you have a choice of five occupations. Antiquarium, Doctor of Medicine, Journalist, Private Investigator, or Professor. I will just note these again in the chat, so if that makes it easier. Private investigator. Okay. You skirt around the details of the profession in your usual way, mentioning only that you have helped the police to clear, clear up various problems in the past. You will hop pounds a little faster as you think of the post you secured at the Blackwood Detective Agency. You've had enough of investigating mar marital infidelity and blank clerks on the take. Sounds like the Blackwood Agency is just the opportunity you need to cut your teeth on some real villainy. Silas narrows his eyes, but he says nothing. Right, so this is going to affect some of your stats. So your credit rating Credit rating is your wealth. Um, so for this, uh, just a second, I need to. Credit rating is 20. So not the wealthiest. Um, in Call of Cthulhu, you're not too worried about items and money. In... If it's reasonable for your character to have it, then you have it. Bookkeeping is a lot more simplified in Call of Cthulhu than some other tabletops that you may be aware of. In some instance, you may roll against the credit. Uh, cr rolling against credit rating might be for if you try to bribe someone, maybe for such. Right, so you have some. Okay. You have some very skills that we will put in some points into. Let me just double check this. Okay, so as a private investigator, your occupation skills are art and craft pho photography, disguise, law. Library use, psychology, spot hidden, and one of either, either charm, fast talk, intimidate, or persuade. You also can pick one of the any other skills on the character sheet you see as a personal speciality. Well, will be eight uh, percentages we will be putting in these skills. So I'll just put those in. And uh, the percentages are 70, 60. 60, 50, 50, 50, 40, and 40. So, I should explain some of the skills we've got here. Photography is all about taking photos and maybe understanding photos or such. Disguise, disguise. Law, understanding the law, maybe using that in some advantage way. Library use tends to be like doing research. Psychology is a lot about um, reading people, understanding what they're doing or the state they're in. Spot hidden is for spotting hidden height and stuff. Um, 
charm is for trying to persuade, well, uh, trying to talk to someone with either nicely compliments, flirting, to get him to see your ways. Fast talk is essentially when you're trying to get what you want through deception, like maybe a little bit of lie or such. Intimidate is, of course, getting what you want through uh, being scary, force and whatnot. Persuade is trying to get what you want through more uh, logical talk. However, persuade takes longer. It's um, gathered if you're trying to persuade someone, you're generally taking a good amount of time for con uh, conversation. And, as we note, uh, the any of the skills apart from credit rating and myth uh, Cthulhu Mythos we can have as a personal speciality. So how about first we start off with picking the personal speciality. If there's any questions you have about any of the skills on the character sheet, just ask. Yes, there is. So, well, let's see. There's there's some combat skills like brawling and whatnot, or with firearms. Locksmithing in can help you lockpick anything. Would you like to do locksmithing? Okay, so we do locksmithing as the um, personal one. Um, so, and we have to also choose one of either charm, fast talk, intimidate, or persuade. Intimidate. Very nice. Okay, so I will just put down an updated list of which eight skills. Okay. So, as a reminder, we need to put the 70, 260s, 350s and the 240s into these eight skills, one at a time. Let's start with the 70. Where would you like the 70 to go of those eight skills? Spot hitting, okay. So, I will note while we do this, if you're using a more in-depth customization, depending on what occupation you pick, you'll get occupation skill points and personal skill points, which you'll be able to spread around and customize it a bit more as you see fit. This is using some quick fire rules where you just put in the values as the book says. Right, uh, where would you like the 260s to go? Disguise. And Locksmith. We now have three fifties.
psychology. One more fifty and library use. Okay. So that leaves the four east to go into Intimidate. And what was the last one? Quote photography. There we go. Okay, excellent. You realise Silas uh, hasn't made a stop since the incident with the tractor. The motor coach winds its way uphill, uh, however your thoughts are interrupted as the road crests a ridge and you are treated to a magnificent view of the vista below. A creek snakes through the valley, breaking the rich autumn palettes of the tree line. In the distance, the white mountains rise into hazy cloud. There is no settlement, not even a cabin as far as the eye can see. Birds drift through the treetops, and you can just make out what might be two white-tailed deer lingering by the water. Perhaps you're making a mistake by moving to the city. Could you survive on your own in this flesh wilderness? You have a base ability in most skills. Listen, the brackets of your skill name. Do, 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 do. Right. Okay, so we need to list your dodge. Which I believe we have in zero at the moment. So your dodge is half of your dexterity. Dodge is of course used for dodging out of the way of things. Right. You now get to choose four skills as personal interest skills. These cannot be any of the ones we had for the occupation. And each of these will be boosted by 20 points. So please pick four skills as a personal interest. Stealth? Okay. Dodge, yeah, we can absolutely increase dodge. Handgun. Very nice. One more. Listen, okay, very nice. Okay. The motor coach rattles on through the hills, and Silas Sil lapses into silence. The sky darkens behind you, pinks tinting the clouds as the sun sends. Finally, a welcome sight comes into view, a settlement on the crest of a hill. This doesn't look like the pictures you're seeing of OCP, but perhaps you can persuade Silas to stop while you stretch your legs. Minutes later, a harsh stuttering from the engine interrupts your ravine. Silas frowns and rattles the gear stick. The motor coach falters in its ascent. So this utters a curse you don't recognise and grinds his teeth, struggling at the wheel. You seem to inch up the hill until you reach the first buildings. Low dwellings constructed from a rough red stone. 
Silas wrestles the coach into a small bay of the road. He scrambles from his seat and makes for the engine compartment. Alright, so... You can choose to make a check for either Drive Auto or Psychology. If you wish to investigate the vehicle yourself, Drive Auto. Or if you would like to get a better read on Silas, 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 how do you say his name? Psychology. Psychology it is then. Okay, so we for this need a hard success. Oh, right, I got it. That is a success. sense of falseness to Silas's actions. He's acting. Either he's not as aggravated about the breakdown as his behaviour suggests, or perhaps the breakdown itself is an act. If this is a ruse to make you spend your time and money in a local shop, he will be sadly disappointed in your purchasing power. So, I will mention this here, so this isn't really relevant to the story necessarily, but You'll see these little stars that most of them are blue, but the one next to Psychology is now yellow. So when you're playing many normal games of Call of, uh, of Cthulhu, when you succeed at a, a check, you get to put a mark next to it to indicate that you've succeeded at it. And at the end of the venture, as long as you have survived, you can make improvement checks for the skills that you have succeeded. Improvement checks, you basically have to try and fail the skill to show that you have learned something in it. But again, this is done right at the end after the adventure. So, so Silas opens the engine compartment. Sentences, hey? Silas opens the engine compartment open and sticks his head inside. The hot metal po uh, pops and sizzles. Pokes at berries and components, then withdraws and wipes his brow, smearing it with dark grease. I ain't sure what's wrong. Might be the oil pressure. Might be something knocked off kilter when we took that spill. Can't do much until the engine cools neither. And with the light failing, I reckon we'll be here through the night. He wipes his hands on a rag. The shadows from your surroundings are already long and the air is chilly. It feels stiff from the journey, and a night in the rickety coach sounds unappealing. Silas so sees your dismay. This is Emberhead. Miles from any place. Only come through twice a week, but the folks here are good people. May Ledbetter keeps a spare room. She'll look after you. Up that alley, turn right, first house on the left. He scratches his cheek, looks again into the engine compartment and spits on the ground. Meet me back here at 8 in the morning, and we see how we stand. You can go and head straight for May Litterbay's head. Uh, May Le Ledbetter's house? That's a na uh, mouthful, that name. You can ask Silas where he will spend the night, or you can challenge Silas about the breakdown. So just to reiterate, you can either head for May Ledbetter's house, ask where Silas is going to spend the night, or 
uh, challenges us about the breakdown. Ask where he's spending the night? All right. You asked about Silas's plans. He gives the engine a so sour glance before answering. I got, mm, excuse me, I got acquaintance here in the village. Reckon one of them owes me a favour. Enough for bread and breakfast in any case. He stares at his grubby hands. Probably won't stretch into a hot bath. You don't seem to have a lot of options. You fetch your cases from the back of the motor coach. The last thing you need is for all your worldly professions to disappear into some stranger's hovel overnight. You drag your cases between the sullen buildings. You feel surprisingly wary, considering you have spent all day sitting down. Silas's directions lead you to a modest dwelling with a slate roof. A name plate reads, Leadbetter, and underneath a sign in neat copper plate reads, Lodging Room. The lane around you is gloomy, but a lamp flickers in the window. A breeze chills your face. You're not about to begin your new life by sleeping in the street, so you rap on the wet of a beating door. After a moment, you hear footsteps inside the house. A bolt is drawn back and the wooden door swings open. A figure with loose curls and rough looking house dress peers at you. Her gaze takes in your travelling suit and your cases. Her voice has a slight iris lit. Hello, should I take it as you're looking for a room for the night? I don't think that's Irish, but you'll just have to go with it. <laughs> you inquire as to her rates, depressing a grimace. As far as you've seen, the village does not offer you many alternatives. Oh, you'll find them very reasonable, she says. You look tired, I may. Come inside and we'll talk over a cup of tea. The Led Better house feels cramped with a low ceiling and simple fittings. But it is well kept, and a cheerful fire crackles in the grate. The aroma of tea is soothing, and the cup warms your finger. Oh, your fingers. Have you come to Emberhood for the festival? asked May. You can either explain what happened with Silas and the coach, or you can ask about the festival while you enjoy your cup of tea. Ask about the festival. Okay. Well now, I suppose the festival is about the only reason folks come to Emberhead. I thought you had maybe come to study it or take photographs. Well, it's not tomorrow night, but the night after. I suppose it looks very strange to a passerby. May tops up your tea. The spout clinks against your cup. We've got the beacon, you see. One night every year there's a torchlit pro procession, and we light the beacon on the cliffs. You've never seen the like of it. They see it keeps the spirit of the village alive for another year. It's a celebration. A celebration. She tails off for a moment and blinks. But you didn't come here to listen to me blather, and you must be hungry. I can rustle you up a bit of stew. How would you like that? You ask again about her rates. And May names a price so low you accept it without hesitation. The room is small but comfortable, and the stew is dark and hearty. After dinner, you have a couple of hours before your usual bedtime. You may talk to May some more, or walk around and get your bearings, or you may turn in for an early night. Look around. May's bro creases when you announce your attention to take a stroll. Mind how you go! Ember heads, um, Ember heads surrounded by cliffs and we don't have your fancy street lamps here. Take the lantern and watch your step. Outside you see what she means. The sky is overcast and only a few glimmers of moonlight peek from the clouds. Without the heavy lantern you would be walking near to darkness. I cannot hope to get an overview of the village tonight. 
Main Street is a narrow passage hemmed in by squat dark dwellings. At the end, however, it opens up. A wide thoroughfare, 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 however you pronounce it, uh, leads off to your right. A crude sign names it Silbury Street. To the left, a few yards away, your light picks out the crooked posts of a simple fence. And beyond that, the ground drops away into darkness. You take a couple of steps closer, but you can see nothing. Air from below calls your face. Then some instinct makes you look around. An ink black figure stands in the road, about 20 yards behind you. It stares at you. You form the sudden impression that it will run at you and throw you over the cliff edge. This is unsettling. Seeing it has been spotted, the figure slips down an alley. Would you like to return to the safety? of the lead better house or would you like to try and confront the dark figure Confront seems like a bad idea, but you're curious. Well, would you like to confront, or...? Let's go say hello to the Shadow. As you approach, the figure takes a pace back, then another. It slips down an alley between two buildings. We have to make a track roll. So we will try to track. I believe we just need a success. Yes. That is a failure. The figure moves fast with almost silent steps. You are hampered with a heavy lantern in an unfamiliar environment. You emerge from the alley into a dusty courtyard and can detect no sign of your quarry. You scratch around for a few minutes, but the figure has gone. It seems unwise to continue your stroll through unknown dark streets while this threatening presence is abroad. You head back to the Leadbetter house. Mary lets you in and settles back in her chair. Soon she begins to yawn. Ah, oh, I believe I'll turn in. When would you like your breakfast? As May stands, you hear a clunk behind you. You look over your shoulder, but all you see is a wooden door, securely closed. May tuts. Ah, the young lady of the house. She has been listening to us. Ruth, come and greet our guest. <laughs> the cat says who would have thought walking around in the dark with a stranger following you was dangerous. I know, right? You just want to say hello. Nighttime hugs. There is a short pause. Then the door creaks open. Two wide eyes peer at you from the gap. Between tousled hair and a rough nightgown. What do you say? The eyes blink. Pleased to meet you. Now, get back to bed. The door closes again. My daughter Ruth, ten years this summer. She's a delight and a torment all in one. Don't worry, she sleeps in with me. She'll not disturb you. Good night now. You retire to your room. It's a little chilly, but you are too tired to worry about lighting the fire. The sheets are clean and the bed soon warms up. The silence, out the silence outside is strange after living in the town for so long, but you soon drop off. You dream of fire in the grate. Colours shimmering through the dancing tongues of flame. At first they are tiny, almost microscopic, but they grow and grow 
until a kaleidoscopic infernal spills from the fireplace, spreading across the floor, up the sheets, and you wake with a start. Daylight glints through the curtains. You get up and examine the grate, blinking the sleep from your eyes. It is quite cold. May seems to have no running water, but has supplied some in the Samaric jug. You freshen up at the, uh, the washstand and go in. She cooks a hearty breakfast and leaves you in peace to eat. At about 7.30, you are paid up, packed and ready to go. You bid May goodbye and she wishes you the best for your new career in Arkham. You are already tired of your heavy bags. Hopefully Silas has repaired the uh, motor coach and you can just resume your long journey. A sour person might be, but the old driver seemed to understand his vehicle well enough. You pause to check your watch, still 20 minutes early, and round the final corner, and the motor coach is gone. You put your bags down and search the area, tracking up and down the slopes and around corners. At the edge of the village, you trace the long road back as it winds across the hills. 8 o'clock comes and goes, and there is no coach to be seen. A passing villager notices your bags. Looking for the bus? I heard him take off at first light. He's due back in three or four days. If you need a place to stay, you may Ledbetter rent a room. The man raises his hat to you and strolls on into the village. You curse, so, so it's under your breath. Perhaps he went for parts, but you wonder if the old goat has stranded you here on purpose. May is doing laundry and looks surprised to see you again. You're absolutely right, cat. How rude of him. Forgot something? When you explain the situation, she offers to store your bags while you try to arrange a turn to transport. You're grateful to relinquish the load. Nobody here has anything like a car. She strokes her chin and narrows her eyes. Maybe you could find somebody with a horse and a cart for your bags? I could ask around later. Try Mr. Winter at the uh, Mr. Winters at the village hall. He'll know if anyone will. Or ask him on the artisans. Their workshops are first left on Silbury Street. She reaches over and sque squeezes your wrist. Don't worry. I won't see you sleeping in the street, money or no money. You thank May and turn to face the village. You wander the streets of Emberhead without any particular destination in mind. The village is built on a relatively flat upland with splendid views. To the north, the hazy tips of the white mountains reach for the heavens. To the south, the sparkling waters of Lake. Okay, let's. Winnipesaki? Um, Osaku? I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Touch the horizon. The village itself takes less than five minutes to cross from edge to edge. You arrived on the winding road to the west. The only other road leads to the south, following a lower ridge of land as it turns east. In the southwest of the village, an open grassy space borders a ruined church, its graveyard cresting the cliffs. To the northeast, the three main thoroughfares meet at the raised black metal structure. It looms dark against the blue sky. You may ask about transport at the local general store. You can try and seek out the village hall. You could try to walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road. You could examine the large metal structure. You could explore the ruined church. Or you could look for local people with their own transport needs. What was the first one? so it was ask about transport at the local general store or you could seek out the village hall or you could walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road you could examine the large metal structure you could explore the church or you could look for local people with their own transport 
or transport needs, I should say. Check out this church. Okay. You cross the street towards the church. As you glance to your left, your gaze alights on the large metal structure. Something bothers you about its positioning. You back up and look again. Yes, Emberhead's central thoroughfare points directly at the structure. This seems too precise to be a coincidence. You press on and draw into the shadow of the church. The building is in a sorry state. The top of the steeple is missing, a ragged gash of splintered boards mark in its absence, and the floors beneath it have collapsed. It appears to have torn through the roof of the main building as it fell. Only the back half is still intact. The white paint which once covered the church has yellowed and peeled. It seems safe enough to explore the rear section. Our old pews are stacked against the wall, choked with mildew. Most of the windows are broken. You guess this church has been disused for about 20 years or so? There's little more to interest you. Just a second. Okay, we need to make a ride check. And for and you will also have a bonus dice for this check. So when bonus dice are rolled, um, so how it works in general is for the D hundred essentially two D tens, one for the single digit, one for the double digits. Bonus dice means you get to roll the tens digit twice, and if it's a bonus, you take the lower number. If it's a penalty, you take the higher number. Okay, let's have a look see. Ride. Get a bonus dice. No surprisingly, that is a fail. You are beginning to get your bearings in Emberhead. Would you like to explore some more? Uh, so, if you're ready to move on. Uh, uh, so, you can eat. Okay, let's start that sense again. You can either move on with your day, or you may do some of the previous options that you didn't do previously. So there was about asking about transport to the local general store, seeking out the village hall, checking out the eastern road, uh, checking out the large metal structure, or looking for local people with their own transport needs. So for anyone curious of why nothing seemed to come up with the ride check, it's one of those checks where essentially, if you succeeded, you may have noticed something. But, as the roll was a failure, it just carries on. The large structure. You walk up the approach, the most central of the village's major streets. It points directly at the odd metal structure. As you emerge from the shade of the nearby buildings, you are greeted by a magnificent panorama spread from the north to the southeast. The last colours of full tint the hills in a sleepy gold. The structure, by contrast, is made from uncomprising iron, singed black. It sports an immense curved platform at the level of your head. But a strut snake up to a central point. It looks like they may have been some kind of sculpture at one point, but are now twisted and melted beyond recognition. An older gentleman passes, looking up at you with roomy eyes. Are you here for the festival? That's the beacon! When they light it, night after next, you'll be able to see it ten miles away. He gives a little nod of satisfaction, then moves on, leaning on his walking stick. Now you notice bundles of wood, 
tide and sacked against the buildings nearby. Perhaps this festival would be an interesting diversion, but you really must head to Arkham as soon as possible. You must make an 8 spot hidden roll. That is a success. Cat says, I'm worried we're going to be part of that fire. I can neither confirm or deny these allegations. I will leave you with that the name of it is Alone Against the Flames. All right. As you walk away from the iron structure, you notice something strange about the construction of the village. All the wooden dwellings are concentrated in the west and southwest. To the, nor to the east and northeast, closest to the beacon, the buildings are formed from dark brick and clay. Does this mean the spittlement began at the deacon and spread west? Okay, would you like to explore more of Emberhead? So you can either choose to move on with your day, or you could ask about transport at the local general store, seek out the village hall, check out the eastern road, or look for local people with their own transport needs. Ah, eastern road. The air is fresh and the walk down to the lower ridge invigorating. You notice cultivated fields stretching through the lowlands around the Emberhead and among the crops some livestock. But no horses. Are you going to have to make your uh, uh, onward journey on foot? Further down the road skirts the edge of the ridge and descends. There are a few scattered hovels here with signs of habitation. They are set a substantial distance apart. As you examine them, a door opens and an older man steps out. He wears a big raggled suit, but carries a piece of cloth which he tosses over his head like a hood. As he does this, he sees you and freezes. We must make a luck roll. A success? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so close to free, you're absolutely right. Just making sure I have the right one. The man looks up the village, scanning the cliff tops. You get a brief flash of his face. There is something unsettling about it. Then he turns to walk away from the road, but as he does, he raises a hand and slowly beckons to you. Would you like to follow him or not? Follow the stranger. You follow the man around the outcrop. He glances up, then steps between two rocks and vanishes. Closer inspection reveals a narrow channel leading into the cliff. There's just enough light to see a small natural chamber within. You will be uncomfortably close to this man if you go inside. Would you like to follow him in, or keep your distance?
Just keep uh, hang on a moment. Uh, no, keeping distance means you stop following him. Then let's hug. Okay, you got it. With wary steps, you squeeze between rocky outcrops and enter the concealed chamber, almost banging your head on the low ceiling. The man settles back against the wall and watches until you draw close. Then he slides back his hood. We need to make a sanity roll. A success. Some of the man's face remains. A strip from the side of his jaw to his right eye socket is healthy and pale, if aged, but the left side is consumed by angry scar tissue. One eye droops, hooded by melted flesh, and the nostril on that side is pulled open to leave a gaping hole. The disfigured man studies your reaction with his one good eye. Name's Arbogast. Willard Arbogast. Guess I don't need to ask what brings you to Emberhead. You can either claim to have come for the festival, or admit that Silas has stranded you here. A very rude bus driver. I'll take it that you want to um, admit that then. <laughs> a very rude bus driver brought me here. <laughs> All right. That, that swollen mouth gives a little twist downwards. Son of a bitch has rat's blood. His fingers tighten into a fist. Abagas fixes you with a lopsided yet intense stare. You seek me out, eh? He looks up at the cave ceiling. Which one of them told you about me? Never mind, it doesn't matter. Truth is, they fear what I know. They never come at me direct. Don't want to end up like old Abagast. He giggles. The high pitched sound is all the more grotesque coming from those bloated lips. Then abruptly, his gaze turns to iron. Emberhead died 40 years ago, shattered by flame, consumed by the stars himself. The ancient hill was cleansed by a ferno. And from the blackened ground came new life, as is the way of all things. The Abbey K knew. Abagas wipes his nose on his sleeve. Except none of that happened. The flames were turned away. The necessary death postponed a year, and a year again. And now those up there, he scrabs his scrawny finger at the ceiling, think themselves saviors of the village. Think they can divide the uh, great old ones. Ah, cuff. Kafuga, he shakes his, shakes his head. With strange eons, these lives matter less than the blink of an eye. Fierce intelligence burns in his gaze, but you suspect Abagas might be quite insane. Should his move change, it would not be difficult to seize one of the loose rocks and crack his skull, would it? You can ask him about the Abakag... Abenaki... You can ask him about the Great Old Ones, you can ask him about the villages, or you can leave. The first, the Abeni Abenaki? Pretty sure I'm saying it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to pronounce. The Benaki? He frowns. They knew this land and cherished it. They lived here in harmony for their lot of time. Air and earth, water and fire. They said did every daybreak as a gift, and they trod lightly on the land. 
Yet, we came and we ended them. Their time is past. Now ours too must end. Epigus runs a hand through his hair. A wide strip is missing on the left side, replaced by scar tissue. He climbs to his feet. Abogast, Abogast pauses in the shadows. There's something about you. Something the previous ones never had. Perhaps you can make it through. If you want to hear more, meet me again after dark. Nine o'clock. The graveyard on the other side. He lifts a gnarled finger. Don't be followed, else I won't be there. This ain't the time of year for a showdown. Abogast wipes his nose on his sleeve again. Go now. Their eyes are on me. Oh, and stranger, don't try to run. You'll never make it. You emerge into the sunlight blinking and more than a little shaking. Okay, just a second. We've discovered a secret. Later tonight, um, you have a chance to follow up on this appointment. Uh, I will just make a note of this. You turn back to the road and your core business. Getting out of Emberhead and onwards to Ossipi. The ridge gives you a good viewpoint from which you can see the course of the road. It winds with the hills, disappearing into woodland for a while before merging further on. You lose sight of it somewhere towards a second patch of woodland. By your best estimation, there is at least six or seven miles distant. You see no other settlements or traffic. It may be worth taking a chance and walking. The weather is still mild, but you will need supplies before you attempt it. Would you like to explore more? You can ask about at the local uh, general store for transport. Uh, you could check out the village hall. You could ask the local people. However, time soon progresses and this will be your last choice out of these options. Did I mention the village hall? I did, didn't I? Yes. So, you can ask about transport at the local general store, check out the village hall, you could look for local people with their own transport needs, or you can just pass the time and move on. Just want to move on, okay. Your morning excursions have left you hungry. You roam the streets of Emberhead looking for sustenance. There's nothing resembling the busy calves of your hometown or anything that might be called a restaurant. It's beginning to look like you have to get supplies from the general store when May Ledbetter comes down the street with a girl trailing in her wake. This must be Ruth. As she notices you, she races past her mother and approaches you with a smile. This is a different Ruth than from the shy creature of last night. As she reaches you, she stops and stretches arms out, uh, arms up in celebration. She looks up into your eyes. Abruptly, a smile drops from her say face and she looks several years older. Get out before the festival, she hisses. Get out! She blinks hard, then scuttles back towards her mother. May approaches, wrapping an arm around her daughter's shoulders. She smiles. How are you getting on? Have you found transport? Startled, you explain the frustrations of the situation. I'll try Mr. Winters in the village hall. He's always been in... Or on of an afternoon. You'll be hungry by now. Help yourself to any food in the house. The door's not locked. You glance at Ruth where she has squirreled herself behind her mother's leg. Her eyes implore you to silence. You may either ask Ruth about what she said, you may ask May about what Ruth said, or you may say nothing.
nothing? Yes, seems the consensus. Nothing it is. You take your leave of the lead betters and head towards the house. The door opens easily. In the low kitchen, you make a meal from stodgy bread and leftover stew. A little window offers a view to the mountains. Yeah. Chat wants to keep a low profile, nice and smooth. If you learned one thing this morning, it was that Emberhead streets hold little to occupy the visitor from out of town. But there are still about five hours of daylight remaining. You could take some provisions under bare essential from your luggage and set out in hope of reaching another settlement before dark, or you could ask advice from Mr. Winters. Would you like to prepare and try to walk out of town? Or would you like to head to the village hall? <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> Running into woods? Fantastic idea, eh? Right, so, is that an idea that you guys want to try and um, talk to Mr. Winters then? Town Hall? Yeah, okay. The village hall overlooks the lower north ridge of the village. You walk along Stillbury Street to find it. Conscious of the oppressive black metal structure framed at the end of the road. The shutters of the hall are open and some windows left ajar. There is no knocker, but a little bell over the entrance tinkles as you push the front door. Inside, a study door to your right is marked private. To your left, an opening leads through to a bright room. You take a few steps inside. Benches line the walls and there are two notice boards uh, mounted between the windows. You may either examine the notice boards or knock on the closed door. Okay, chat seems to want the notice board. The floorboards creak beneath you as you cross the room. You feel a slight spring in your step. Perhaps this humor is used as a gymnasium for the village children. One notice board appears to be for the adults of the community, and one for the children. The former looks neglected, featuring handwritten advertisements for household items and a yellowed note about a telegraph pricing. There's nothing about the festival. The children's notice board has a schedule for weekly uh, freshy services, I'm not sure what that means to be honest, but... Uh, and a number of paintings obviously done by the children themselves. Most are incoherent, though colourful. The best you can tell, they depict fireworks or perhaps the tale of Joseph from the book of Genesis. One has lost a pin and hangs upside down. It shows a giant bird attacking the emberhead. Either it might simply be that the artist has not yet mastered the subtleties of scale. We will make a spot hidden roll. A success. <laughs> the painting was done by Cthulhu himself. He did his best. Ha! Everyone sat somewhere. As the afternoon sun hits the floor, you notice something curious. The boards under the windows are newer than the boards in the centre of the floor. The frames also show signs of having been replaced in the recent past. Perhaps rain leaked in and rotted the wood. <laughs> Even Eldritch Scov needs a hobby. The door scrapes behind you. A middle-aged, bespectacled gentleman appears in the doorway. May I help you? You explain you are visiting on May Ledbetter's recommendation. Ah, well, I'm Clyde Winters. I'm not sure I can help you, but would you care for some coffee? I'm partial to a cup in the afternoon. He gestures to the open door behind him. It seems like a worthwhile opportunity, and you are a little thirsty. Punch him. <laughs> I'm afraid punching him is not an option. Well, I love your gusto. You step through the door marked private. 
The other side of the village hall is in marked contrast to the public space. The room is compact, lined with shelves of books and file clothes. One corner is reserved for a tiny pantry and what is presumably a water closet. <laughs> Cat says don't punch him, shoot him, we're better in handguns. I like to imagine it's like voices arguing in their head. The uh, oh, 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 yes. You study Mr. Winters as he fills the P collator. Although thin on the top, his hair is oiled and neatly swept back. His suit is a sombre affair and well tailored, even if the cut is a little old fashioned, unless a man working alone might have loosened his bow tie for comfort. On the desk against the opposite wall, you notice what looks like a telegraph set. <laughs> The devil and the other devil on the shoulder. Yeah, it's just two devils. Multiple devils. You may ask about the telegraph immediately, or make small talk with Mr. Winters first. Little split here. It does note, I'll just reiterate, ask about the telegraph immediately or make small talk with Mr. Winters first. <laughs> Small talk is so awkward. Take it, you're still split about this. If in case, I can make a 50-50 uh, roll, see, and go with one at random. Okay, we're just going to go ahead and ask him immediately. The telegraph? Hmm, yes. Much as we value isolation, we do need the link sometimes. You were uh, hoping to send a message? I must apologise. The line has been down for two weeks. I reported the fault, but of course, they're not so speedy when the problem lies in a rural area. I am expecting a day. Uh, a I'm expecting a repair the day after next. I do appreciate how frustrating this must be. The coach is due in what three days, but I think he's going west. Perhaps he might engage a wagon. One of the farmers might. You explained that you've asked a few of the residents already, but to no avail. I'll tell you what. Winters pours you a steaming cup of coffee. The dark liquid smells rich and strong. When the repair crew arrive, I'll ask to them to take you back with them. How would that be? They might want a dollar or two to grease the wheels. Uh, day after tomorrow? It's less than a deal, but it's the first real opportunity you've had. You can either thank Winters and Leaf, or you may ask about his library. Mm. 
Yeah, library. Knowledge. You make a small but fluttering remark about a couple of the volumes on the shelves. Winters blushes with pleasure. Well, of course, they're not my personal collection. They belong to the village. Library. Mm -hmm. But I did select most of the recent items. This is the community's library, you see. I put up the private sign to stop people just wandering in from meetings in the other room, but this is really a public space. You scan the shelves. There's a sparse but respectful collection of mathematics and the sciences, passable sections on history and arts and the self literature. Here's a few lowbrow novels tucked away in the corner with tappy, tatty copies of the Bizarre Tales magazine. Quarterly does not also equate to popularity, I'm afraid. Winter gives you an apologetic smile. You could take some time for some research in the library, or you can leave while there's still light outside. Research. All right, doing some research. Winters is happy for you to spend the rest of the afternoon in the study and offers you an upright but comfortable chair. You have enough time to pursue, pursue one line of research in depth. You can may either read about the history of the area read about the festival, read something from the sciences, or to read some of the weird fiction. We got something for the festival. It's a weird fiction, his fan fiction. <laughs> no, I don't believe so. Festival seems good. Okay, looks like we're going with festival. You're not surprised to find there is no published work on Emberhead's festival. Winters pokes around and finds a case monograph, handwritten on the yellow paper by a Dr. Anolowski. Sonic the X Samurai Jack. <laughs> uh, an acquaintance of my father's, I believe. The manuscript is somewhat difficult to read and you make slow progress. Anolowski speculates that the festival has its origin in pagan rites brought over by the Celtic settlers, which celebrate the ancient festivals of Beltane, Samhun, Imbolc, and Luga Zundag. Yeah, if I said that right. I apologize if I uh, uh, mispronounce any of those. There is some discussion on the, the struggle between the seasons and a couple of oblique references to the alignment in uh, Emberhead. Anoliski suggests that the meaning of the festival slowly changed around the turn of the century. The monograph terminates mid-sentence at the end of a page 28, just as it begins to discuss the modern practices. He asks Winters if he has the rain in pages. No, I'm afraid those have been misplaced. Perhaps they're still in the library somewhere, but... He shrugs. I must make time for a forest stock take. The afternoon wears on. You have not quite finished your reading when Winters glances out the window and stands up. He clears his throat. Okay, we must make a credit rating check. That is a failure. I'm afraid I have some errands to run before dark, so I must close the library for today. I do hope you will return tomorrow afternoon if you're so inclined. You leave the building with Winters, waiting as he locks up. You thank him for the coffee and the access to the library. 
he disappears off down an alley. You hope to be away from the village before tomorrow afternoon, but it's good to know there is a place you can occupy yourself. As the light fades, you return to Ledbetter House and eat a light supper. May is unusually tempting. Ruth's eyes flick to yours several times during the meal. There is an urgency there you can't quite interpret. Afterwards, May ushers the gal into their room. You've been in Emberhead for barely one whole day, and you already feel confined by it, both geographically and socially. The evening seems to offer little. You may either do some stargazing, attempt to speak to Ruth, or you can follow up on your pre-appointment with uh, other guest. Time for your day. Meet other guests at the uh, graveyard. Mm -hmm. Abergast is not at the appointed meeting place. You give him ten minutes, but he doesn't show. You curse the old crank and head back towards May's house. Psst. A hand snakes from the doorway and grabs your arm. You jump at the sight of that half-faced glimpse in the starlight. One of them's near, he whispers. Watching. Come with me. <laughs> Abagas leads you across the thoroughfares, slipping between the houses. The metal structure looms at the end of the street. Silent now, he says. But the beacon will come alive tomorrow night. <laughs> I like when people watch. Excellent. You do you. He ushers you into a little alcove behind the village school. Abagas glances behind you, then sits down. Again, you feel uncomfortable in proximity to that scarred visage, one melted eyelid bliss. You don't have long. Understand this. I was the conduit, the interpreter, before that fool winters and his fancy words. The things which come to Emberhead care not for words. Those idiots think this is a ritual sacrifice. He spits on the grass. It's a ritual control. They know the words, but they do not comprehend the forces they call. He sniffs and sits back. No! You have no time for more questions. I will teach you how to end it. In the moment when all is lost, you can turn this hill to the earth, to the death that came 40 years ago. I've tried it myself, but... His head sags. I no longer have the concentration. The chance is simple. It's I can teach you, but you must perform it with the clarity of mind that I've lacked for years. If you wish to learn the strange chant, well, you may learn the strange chant, or if you've had enough of his nonsense, you may leave. Knowledge is power. A wise man can teach us. That he will. Let's listen to what he has to say. You feel very dislocated from reality as you slip, sit on the cliff top behind a school at night, learning a chant by rote from a madman. Abagast is careful to teach you it in sections. He glances into the sky. Won't work right now. Cloud covering the star, but he still takes care not to pronounce the whole thing at once. It has a rhythmic beginning in various appellations, but the core passage is repeated three times. Fear the gloom, mirkliff auf, kufugag, formula hahuf, naga gahunuf, tang il kufuga. I may have pronounced it right. Don't suppose it matters. <laughs> In time, Abagast listens to your recital and nods. Remember every sound, but never speak it if you have plans left on this earth. Discover the secret. 
if your situation ever becomes desperate enough to try the ritual, you'll have an option to try the chant. <laughs> an ancient chant or a stroke, I can't tell. <laughs> if it sounds like you're having a stroke, you're doing the ancient chants right. Let me just put a note. Okay. Abagast leans back. It'll make you one with the living. Uh, a black shape lunges from the dark. It wraps an arm around Abagast's throats and drags him backward out of the alcove. He grabs at the arm, kicking empty air. You see a gleam of a long blade in the moonlight. You must make a dodge roll. A success. A second figure swings at you with some kind of blunt weapon. You shove it aside and scramble out, trying to find a more defensible position. A gurgle draws your attention. Aragas has a hand clamped to his neck. Blood drips between the fingers and spills from his mouth. His assailant stabs again. The wet blade slicing Aragas' wrist even as it sinks into his neck. You see faces now. Low faces, dull in some kind of tarry substance. Eyes gleaming with hatred. Abagus shoves his attacker off, staggering back, more blood cascading down his arm. The old half man has willpower. He plants his feet and raises a hand. <laughs> Pocket glass. <laughs> Alright, uh, let's see. You need to make a sanity roll. A success. A guess howls. A choked wet sound. He stabs his palm forward, fingers curled in a strange gesture. Fire springs from the ground at his feet. A flickering blue wave. It rushes in a stream as if following a line of gasoline directly towards each attacker. Hungry, it climbs their clothing. They shriek as the flames touch their flesh. Abagus drops to one knee. His face is pale in the illumination from the fires. His head hangs forward. Yet even as his hand shudders, his eyes are alight with intractable will. The assailants scream as they flee in different directions, eerie light playing off the buildings as they pass. They leave behind a terrible pungence of seared flesh. Tiny suits of fire dance in the grass for seconds longer, then vanish. Our guest drops. The blood flow from the wounds in Abagus' necks has slowed to a trickle. His breath is shallow and fleeting. You can see his situation is hopeless. His eyes flutter, then close as life departs. You mark a moment in respect. However, the attackers may come back. Who can you trust in this village? You can try to fetch May here, or return to the Leadbetter house and say nothing about the situation. So just to reiterate, it's you can may either bring May here or return to the house and say nothing. Leaning towards nothing. with nothing. The 
The familiar surroundings of your guest room are becoming constrictive. The neat bed, small wardrobe and a dressing mirror have the feel of a prison cell about them. What are you still doing here in Emberhead? Your new life is elsewhere. You want to lie on the bed and stare at a small crack in the ceiling. You turn over the day's events, thinking through the little details you spotted. You're certainly weary from the elation and the fresh air, but do you still feel safe here? You may either let yourself fall asleep or try to stay awake. for all night just a bit longer. Just a second. Um from the wording of it I would say trying to stay awake probably all night. Get some sleep. Okay then. Your eyelids are heavy, and whatever your reservations, blackness soon takes you. You dream again of fire in the grate, a small fitter of lights twinkling a tiny drama. The flames seem to consume nothing, almost to hang in the air. A moment later, they are around your sleeping form, filling the room with flickering colours, blue, yellow, red and purple. They dance on and around you. Their little tongues brush your flesh. You drift awake in the morning light. The sun is already high, but you do not feel well rested. You find yourself preoccupied with little details of the room. The wood grain of the door jab, or a chipped handle on the wardrobe. As you swing out of bed, your stomach gives a lurch and you lean too far over, nearly tumbling to the floor. You blink for a moment. Perhaps you have an illness coming on. You get carefully to your feet, and the air in the room is heavy and fragrant. You stare out the window until you feel steady enough to leave. You will be suffering a penalty today. Doesn't apply to luck, sanity or damage, but everything else. Is this a wet drink I have in the time? <laughs> The Ledbetter kitchen is empty, although bread and eggs have been laid out for your breakfast. There is a note from May explaining that she has taken Ruth out for a few hours. You may investigate the uh, fight for last night if you want to investigate the aftermath, or if you want to uh, ignore that. Would you like to investigate the uh, aftermath of the fight or not? up something interesting investigating
matter was it investigated or not. <laughs> now I'm investigating for some heart games. <laughs> What is brain? Alright, it sounds like we're not going to investigate this. Okay. You make a quiet circuit of the village, pausing in unproduced places to watch the villagers. It is rather busy for this time in the morning. Yawning locals stream back and forward along the roads, carrying bundles of split logs to the site of what you've heard referred to as the beacon. You see two figures already up in the superstructure arranged in the wood. The Vestal Bonfire will be most impressive. But do you tend to stay to see it? You expect by now that something is amiss here. No shit, you saw a guy murdered. While the villagers are distracted, you may do some illicit investigation, or you may simply leave town without looking back. You could search May Ledbetter's bedroom, go alone to the village hall, Take a closer look at the artisan's courtyard, spy on activity at the beacon, or slip down to the east road and flee. <laughs> Not murdered, just taking the surprise nap. <laughs> Leaving town is a smart choice, but where's the fun in that? Carrie is adventurous. That he is. So. <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea to flee. The now sleeping man said not to leave. <laughs> right, so just go over. The demon said to leave. <laughs> <laughs> do you listen to but where to investigate first do you listen to the sleeping man or the demon and demons are known for their reliability alright so just to go over the options again you can try and search May's uh, bedroom you could go alone to the village hall take a closer look at the artisan's courtyard spy on the beacon or of course try to run Village Hall. Another note for the beacon. So you're leaning towards either Village Hall or the beacon at the moment. Do the beacon? It sounds like bacon, which means it's a good thing. Alright. Beacon it is. That's a great point. <laughs> the northern side of the village is bustling, and you are unlikely to remain hidden there for long. You head in the direction of the church, and then move up to the east side, behind the houses. A drop looms on your right. One particular section of ground is quite narrow, and you have to hug the buildings for support. You could try to give up to it, however, let's have a look-see, uh, size, is your dex higher than your size? It is. It 
if you um so in regards to this since your dex is higher than size you can just proceed if you wanted to proceed through otherwise you would have to make a natural world roll so would you like to proceed i'm assuming giving the part uh, the ninja uh comments and such you would like to proceed Yeah, that's a happy ass up there. All right. The turf sinks beneath your feet and stones crumble from its edge. Alarmed, you grip the building and ease yourself forward. Finally, you have a good spot to watch the beacon. You lie concealed in the grass and watch the activity around the beacon. Villagers bring in yet more bundles of tinder and stack them in neat bundles. Another shift passes the bundles up to a pair of men standing in a raised platform of the beacon. They're constructing a triangular structure resembling a gigantic campfire. As you watch, you are struck by the manner of the labourers. This is their festival. You would expect a cheerful atmosphere and some light-hearted conversation. Yet the faces of some show resignation and detachment, others a naked dread. You watch for a good half hour before you slip away. You feel a deepening unease about Emberhead and this day in particular. Uh, you may try um, so we have the previous options again you may do two more options of these you may search May's bedroom go alone to the village hall look closer at the artisan's courtyard or try to flee down the east road Check the courtyards. You approach around the back of the buildings in Emberhead's northwestern corner. By this time in the morning, you would expect activity in the artisan's courtyard, but the benches and anvils sit deserted. Your footsteps echo of the surrounding walls. One of the workshops is shut up and padlocked. You peek through the joints, but you can see nothing aside. You could try to um, lockpick the padlock or physically break into the locked workshop, or to just move on. Locksmith is decent. Yes, so you would like to go for that? Okay. You examine the padlock. It is old and not particularly secure. There are plenty of metal shavings around that could work as improvised picks, but can you really pick a lock? Okay, just a second. Well, um, so, it uh, notes that due to the old and particularly unsecure lock, you may double your skill for this roll only. Um, so, do you know what? As long as you don't fumble this, uh, you are a success. Well, there we go. You push aside the door and step inside the workshop. The air is cool against your face and you see a light glinting through the eaves. 
The centre of the room features a raised slab with a slight slope. Indation beneath it suggests something sits there. A basin, perhaps? Prone shapes are racked against, uh, against the far wall, covered with red cloth. They look human. You can investigate further, or if you think you've seen enough, you can move on. Could be new friends. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we got to fit our way in just to leave straight away. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take that. You're going to investigate. You approach the red shrouded figure, suspecting them at any moment to leap up and grab at you. There are three. Each has a label hanging from its toes. Benjamin Kramer, uh, Kramer. Uh, 1 slash 19 slash 1927. Abraham Holmesworth, 4 slash 22 slash 1927. Marion Phipps, 8 slash 6 slash 1927. You lift one corner of the shroud, and underneath, wrapped in tight branches, is a thin but unmistakably human form. You are looking at three dead bodies. Embalmed dead bodies. Let's make a Santi roll. A success. Music kicked in perfectly. <laughs> Excellent. So, I thought you looked like a snoop. Like what you found, did you? A burly villager fills the doorway, blocking out much of the daylight. You can make out a dark apron and a thick beard. He steps forward, fists raised. Carrie is so saying says one of the voices in his head. <laughs> I would like to help you with your bodies. You may either surrender without a fight, or fight the arson. I'll do both fight a bit, but I only really submit to my fate. <laughs> Screw this dude, we're fighting. We aren't very good with our brawl, but the dead bodies mean it's probably better to fight. Alright, we're fighting. You struggle with the huge man. His fins, his fists come out of the darkness like hammers. Alright. Give me a second. Just 
gonna quickly <laughs> I put on a fake moustache to tell you went that way. We'll just take a moment to just we'll just make this a little simpler for us <laughs> Laura's 50 let's just tell him it's illegal to hurt people <laughs> that was a great plan Yes, the man who collects bodies would definitely let us go if we threaten him with the law. Sorry, it just takes me a second to quickly set this. combat the one with the highest dexterity goes first Which, in this case, is yourselves.
Right, so, first round of combat. So in combat, you can attempt to, let's say, attack someone with, uh, like, fighting brawl, for example. Or you could also try to do things like um, maneuvers. Maneuvers are generally any time you want to do something different, uh, be it as simple as grappling people or or tripping them over or things like that. It's not going to be less asking about his mother. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> All right. Let me just double check that. Oh, so do you have a do you know what that's a very good point you guys are a uh, private investigator do you know what i will allow a gun so as we mentioned earlier in the um in the stream uh in call of cthulhu if it's reasonable for your character to have something they have it there's no fussing about with stuff sometimes you may have to say that you're cleric stuff but because even that you are essentially moving across um you know to a new life you pretty much have all your possessions and as a private investigator especially with hand game gun training as a personal interest yes uh i just need to get the stats for it so one moment Okay. <laughs> Guildmaster says, shoot our own face. Cat says, how about we try shooting them in the face first? All right, but that doesn't work. It's plan B. Plan B is shoot yourself in the face, apparently. Okay, I think a revolver is very thematic for this, eh? So we're just going to go into combat. Add one in. And a note point thirty two oh, revolver. Oh, I did it on uh, melee, didn't I? My bad. Just a second. Delete that. Add it in range. Point thirty two revolver. Uses fire arms handgun. Range is 15 yards. Damage is 1d8. Don't 
yes, we set it in pale. Well, function is on a hundred. Use the per around one in brackets. Re max. Oh, actually, I see. They've just separated it. Magazine six. I won't further change the image. Okay! Handgun is in place. How about a... <laughs> All right. We'll just stick with the revolver, but uh, plus the ones you're noting, I don't think are even available. Okay. Anyway, uh, um, so something to note is if you are intending to shoot, uh, you have a plus bonus 50 to your dexterity as it's quicker for someone who is preparing to shoot. However, if you are not going to shoot on your turn then your dex will drop for that round potentially allowing some with a higher dex to go before you even though okay let's just say for example for example your dexterity is 60 with a gun ready if you are to shoot with gun you have a dexterity of 110 let's say you're going against someone with a dexterity of 80 so they go second however say you want to do something that isn't shoot your gun you drop back down to your 60 value, and that way the other person goes first. Anyway, you're first. You have a gun. I'm assuming you would like to shoot the man. Oh, we shooting. All right. Okay. Okay, let's have a look. See here, right in his eye. So there is a rule for firing multiple shots. So. With the handguns, you are capable of firing two or three shots per round. One shot is a more careful aim and steadying of the weapon, while firing more than one shot places speed above accuracy. When firing two or three shots in one round, roll for each shot individually. When each, with, but all shots would have a penalty. So, would you like a penalty on all those shots, or just one without? That being said, I believe you're also point blank. Just one shot. For us to do one? Okay. Uh, that is a failure. I believe I did that, so I'm kind of wrong, but whatever. Plan B. Right, on to the artisan. He is going to attempt to punch you in the face. Just a second. He's... NPCs, cheats, or oh, something. Ah, here we go. All right. He rode a failure. So you can either try to dodge or fight back or do nothing.
I'll just double check about fighting back. <laughs> We're cornered at Hamel. <laughs> so something to know is when you are dodging, um, I think you just need to match their result. While if you are fighting back, you then generally need to beat their result. Okay, fighting back. Okay, so you can only fight back with your unarmed. Is that absolutely fine? I mean, the other guy fails, so I suppose you're not at any risk. Knee him in the chin. Both sides failed. Fantastic. You dodge his blow and, uh, yeah, try to knee him back, uh, but fail. Your turn again. Would you like to shoot the man again? Or try to. We <laughs> shoot ourselves in the face like planned. Gotta stick to the game plan. Let's shoot at ourselves, miss and hit them. Alright, I'm gonna roll for a shoot. Uh, another failure. This is going fantastically well, hey? A success! Would you like to fight back or dodge? <laughs> it's kind of faulty. The uh, art's in attacking you. He has a success on his attack. Would you like to fight back or dodge? I've seen fight back, so guess we'll do that. And a failure. Oof. So we see seven damage. Uh, you, when you receive half of your uh, maximum health in one hit, you take a major wound, and then you have to do a concentration to stay conscious. The concentration was a failure. Oh, good. Yes. What? Well done, guys. You put up a spirited resistance, but the man's bulk and determination wears you down. Finally, he lands a crushing blow and you drop. Blackness floods in. Later, you're dimly aware of your legs being lifted and your back scraping against the ground as you're dragged off. Uh, you are restored a hit point.
The fading light from a narrow window tells you afternoon is giving way to evening. Your hands are shackled behind your back so you cannot even lay down on the rough bed. A woman you have not seen before comes in. Her face is wrinkled and her eyes dull. They do not meet yours, but she puts a cup to your lips. Would you like to accept the drink or reject it? Now, this was your secret plan all along? <laughs> to put up a fight, but fuck it? Magnificently fuck it as that. <laughs> you did it perfectly. <laughs> well done. Oh, you did say that you would like to fight a little, but then submit to your fate. That went fantastically. Well, anyway, so would you like to accept the drink or reject it? To getting my ass kicked, I'm a little parched. I mean, free drink. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, yeah, I reset the drink. You drink from the cup. It holds cool, refreshing water, which you gulp down. When it's empty, she turns to leave. You speak to her, but she steps outside and closes the door. Yeah, later you try yelling. Your voice must be audible outside, but it has no effect. It seems the entire village is involved. As the light fades outside, your little prison becomes dark. You can hear much activity around the building. Occasionally, an orange glow passes the window. The only comfortable position in the shackles seem to be to sit against the end of the bed with your arms hanging behind you. You need to concentrate and come up with a plan. It's clearly an escape from your bonds. You do not know exactly what your captors want from you, but you cannot ignore the fact that you spent the entire day constructing a massive bonfire. The door scrapes, retching you back into the moment. Orange light spills into the house from blazing torches held at the threshold. Two large villagers step in and grab you. At least you assume they're villagers. They wear heavy black cloaks, and their faces and hands are painted entirely black, save only for a red triangle centred on their left eye. You try to drag your legs, but they reach under your arms and lift your, you boldly, bodily from the bed. Outside, it seems the whole village has gone great to see you. Every single one has a blackened face with a red triangle motif. Torches sputter and spill fire. You struggle, but you can see physical resistance is hopeless. You are marched to the central suite and turned to face the beacon. The procession down the approach is slow and formal, save when you sense weakness and yank at your captors. A chill touches you when you see three human shapes carried ahead of you draped in red cloth. Be the beacon looms larger and larger, its dreadful silhouette a black triangle pointing to the stars. A low drone blends among the cloaked figures. Unbidden, the word mourners comes to mind. Smoke from their torches makes you cough. You feel heat on your face. As you reach the cleared area around the beacon, three dancers break from the pack. Young girls swinging balls of fire in spectacular arcs draw in circles in the night air. One by one, they draw close to you and touch your forehead with sooty fingers. Each kisses you three times, on the left cheek, right cheek, then the forehead. Then they whisper in your ear. The smell of kerosene fills your nostrils. You must make an appearance check. Maybe getting pants wasn't so bad. A success! Three levels of success. <laughs> we look great. <laughs> For someone getting absolutely smashed in the face, you look great.
Through your sacrifice, the village will be reborn, says the first dancer. You pass from earth to air for all our sakes, says the second. I've weakened the chains, says the third. Don't try to escape until the flames are high enough to hide you. You stare at the third dancer. In that inky visage, you clearly discern the frightened features of Ruth Ledbetter. Their dance weaves off and disappears behind the buildings. As you arrive beneath the beacon, ten villagers close in on you, working with surprising coordination. They immobilise you and lift you up to the blackened iron stairs to the raised platform. You cannot help but shiver at the sight of the central framework, twisted from past blazers in what you can now clearly see to be fastening points for chain. None of the eyes meet yours as they lash you to the metal. The village sings now, something rhythmic and ancient carved from odd syllables. A second group ascends to the beacon, carrying the three red draped bodies. With reverence, they arrange their burdens in a triangle around your feet. Then they withdraw, leaving you alone with the dead, shin deep in a sea of kindling. It seems the entire village has gathered around the beacon to watch you burn. Behind the face paint, you recognise May Ledbetter. And yes, that is Silas, the coach driver standing at her side. The audacity and scale deception staggers you. A man steps up on... This music really isn't fitting, is it? <laughs> I'm sorry, it really distracted me. Okay, this will do. <laughs> what a very, very rude bus driver. The audacity and scale of deception staggers you. A man steps up on the desk and raises his hands with quiet authority. The frame of the spectacles obscures the red triangle in his face. <laughs> yeah, but I knew at the sake is about as rude as it gets. So we draw here together again on this night, as we do each year, and we give thanks to the ones who will preserve the village against the fire of the void. You will be taken by the ones from above in our stead. Your death will bring life to our streets and bounty to our fields. It will safeguard our children and our elders alike for another year. We salute you. He bows his head. All around the beacon, bearers step forward and lift their torches to the edge of the raised platform. A ring of tiny flames flicker up around the perimeter. As they wink, the singing of villagers drop into an unearthly rhythm. You can try to throw all your remaining strength against the bonds, or wait and see what happens. <laughs> we wait, we're getting a bit cold. <laughs> I was feeling a little chilly. Yeah, it's a bit chilly. All right, we, we wait a bit, let it warm up a bit. The flames snake across the kindling, catching and rising. Smoke rises and it becomes difficult to see the villagers. The three bodies around you catch fire, blazing with sooty red flames. You begin to cough as the smoke enters your lungs and you fight down the urge to panic. You learned a strange chant, so if you wish, you may chant it. Do you wish to chant, or not? Uh, I will note, if you're interested in chanting, this is your chance now, as in... There is no other chance. That's if you want to do the chant. <laughs> it's 
singing time. Singing time it is. Or oh, have a stroke, still can't figure it out. The flames draw closer to you as you bring Abagast's chant to mind. It's hard to clear your head as the heat grows beneath your feet. You cough and sputter, but you sustain the words. Finally, you reach the key passage, and even as your clothes catch fire, you yell for the third time. The swelling tongues of fire around you stop in midair. The people around the beacon freeze. The black painted face is bleached and stripped as the second sun opens in the air above Emberhead. In an instant, the people, the village, the hill, all are consumed. Incinerated by impossible proximity to sheer combustion. The essence of fire. Though your body is bound to the beacon, your being is freed. As a spark, you race into space, catapulted through vastness of the void. The stars burn past you with incomprehensible velocity, and then you are home. Forever you will dwell here, at Fumalhunt, where the flames ripple and flow through immense spaces to the rhythms of the universe, where planets themselves move and tilt through un Utterable wheels of fire, bound to the clockwork chaos of the living flame. And among the flames, you will dance. Congratulations! You have single handedly destroyed a section of New Hampshire about 16 miles in diameter. This has also killed you. And that was alone against the flames. Woo, we ascend our physical form. You absolutely did. So for anyone watching this now or a later date, this is but one of the endings. <laughs> Guildmaster says, we were trying to get away from our old life. This is definitely a change, eh? <laughs> we de you definitely did succeed. There are multiple endings. Uh, so if Alone Against the Flames is one that is absolutely free. You can also pick this up from their website um, and give it a go yourself. You get an idea of how it's run. Uh, but the book is pretty much very beginner friendly. So you don't need to read through um, a t uh, the rule book or such. You can sort of just jump in and just follow as it says. A lot of it might be a bit confusing. So you may want to check on some of the skills. But as I said, you can also play again. And as with all these adventure books, once you've played it once or twice, you can always, you know, just keep a finger on the page, if you will. Remember a few numbers, go back to it like a checkpoint, and just experience it all. Uh, I think that will be it for tonight. If, if you enjoyed this, uh, let me know. Uh, let me know if you would like to see maybe this one again, or some of the others, like Alone Against the Frost. Uh, I know they got four in total. Frost is one that's doable. There's some that had some extra uh, longer time. Yes, Guildmaster, absolutely right. We've played. Uh, we've done some longer games before, and this one is definitely good taste of um, what a full game is almost like. Obviously, in a full game, there's a lot more freedom. Although, in the same sense, this one helps guide you in the right direction with the choices. That being said, a keeper can always have other ways of events or hints to help direct people in the right direction if needed. On that note, if you're still interested in seeing maybe some Call of Cthulhu, one thing we could do, uh, I could look into some time, is maybe also running um, like a module of Call of Cthulhu online, not one of the solo adventures. Whether that would be like a Pacific players on stream go running through it or trying to do it with Twitch in some way. I work out but yeah please let me know but I hope you enjoyed uh, the uh, Call of Cthulhu Alone Against the Flames let's see if there's anyone else online if there's anyone else on nope no one that I know right in that case we'll just end it for tonight but uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I have to say that was one of the most fantastic endings you guys achieved um, I hope to see you next time and uh, 
Have a good day, everyone. Bye.